Hello everyone, welcome again to another ADRA Insider podcast. This week especially, we're uh, doing a series for our Week of ADRA Emphasis. And today our guest is the Executive Director of ADRA Canada and uh, so nice to have you on the program today. Yeah, Steve. thanks for the invitation, Frank. Great to be here. Now, uh, how long have you been serving as the Executive Director for ADRA, Steve? You know, it seems like about a year, but uh, it's actually almost four years now that I've been with Whoa. ADRA Canada. Yeah, that's those four years have gone by fast. <laughs> They've gone by very fast. Yeah. But I think you throw COVID into the middle of things, yes. and everything loses its time perception. Yes. So yeah, it's. <laughs> I think you're right. Tell us a, a little bit about your background. What were you doing before you became uh, the director for ADRA? Yeah, so I actually started out my career as an environmental engineer. So that's what I studied in university and um, worked primarily as a project manager, went from solely environmental to, you know, I used to do environmental, like contaminated site cleanups, those sorts of things. Mm. Um, and then I moved into more construction sided. I uh, actually used to tear down old gas stations, replace oh. them and clean up contaminated sites wow. uh, and then build the new infrastructure. So that's how I got into construction. And then from there, just continued to get into larger construction projects. Uh, before joining ADRA, I actually uh, used to do a lot of work for uh, some, the University in Newfoundland, where um, you know, I built a science building, a student residence building, that sort mm. of uh, construction. So started getting into larger construction projects and also got to build a school uh, dental clinic and daycare for the uh, the First Nations Reserve oh, in okay. Newfoundland as well, which was uh, which is a great experience. So, if our viewers haven't noticed already, you are from Newfoundland. Absolutely, <laughs> I do still have a little bit of an accent, and I don't want to lose that. It's always nice to sure. to keep those roots for sure. But uh, yeah, so I'm from Newfoundland originally. Um, I'm I actually lived in Ontario for. About five or six years before moving back to Newfoundland, I spent 10 years there and then uh, took the call to join ADRA in March of 2018. Okay. Yeah, nice. And I've been there ever since and I've been just absolutely loving it. So you've learned a lot about ADRA over the last four years, uh, different trips you've gone on. I noticed you're, is this from Newfoundland? Is this where, what they wear in Newfoundland? <laughs> or, or what? No, no, this is, uh, so we're going to, I want to fill you in a little bit in a a trip that I had to Peru recently. Okay. And so this was a gift. It was given to me by Adra Peru. And uh, they, uh, they gifted this as a, as a thank you for, for coming and visiting. In uh, relation to your talking about Peru, I've prepared a video report that I would like our viewers to watch. Uh, maybe we can go ahead and watch that right now about uh, the project that Adra Canada is sponsoring in the highlands of Peru. Let's take a look. High up in the Andean mountains of Peru, indigenous people groups attempt to eke out a living, primarily through the raising of llamas and alpacas. Direct descendants of the Inca, the Quechua are dedicated to keeping the traditions, culture and language of their people alive. The land is owned by the community and individual families are granted access to build their homes and animal shelters, as well as grow potatoes, their one staple food. The mountains that surround the small farms provide stunning views. Some of the highest peaks are still covered with pristine glaciers. With climate change, ice and snow are melting revealing amazing formations and unique layers of mineral deposits of beautiful colors. At an altitude of 13,500 feet, the air is thin, 
The winters are cold and vegetation is sparse. Small herds of alpacas, needing large areas to feed, range further and further in search of vegetation. Every year, thousands of alpaca are lost to frigid cold temperatures. When deep snows come, it is difficult for them to find enough grass to eat. Their deaths take a serious toll on the household incomes of families living in the shadow of the Andean mountains. Living above the tree line, building materials are limited to mud bricks and stones. Houses are covered with thatch roofs that don't offer a lot of insulation from the cold winter winds. Most of the homes have just one room of about 16 feet by 10 feet with a dirt floor. The cook stove is usually located at one end of the room. With no wood, the fuel used for cooking and heating is primarily dried alpaca dung. Without proper ventilation, each time food is prepared, the one-room home fills with smoke. Prolonged exposure causes a variety of respiratory illnesses, especially in children and the elderly. My husband and I raised six children here in this house. We were very fortunate that all six of our children survived. Many of our friends had children who died because of the cold winters. There were some winters when we were not able to afford shoes for our children and they would get frostbite on their toes. It seemed like they were always sick with some kind of cold, flu, or diarrhea. We had no medicine. Instead, we would brew tea and pray they would recover. I was born in this part of Peru and grew up here with my parents. Our house was just the one room that included our stove. Our house was always full of smoke, dust, and ash. We really didn't have windows, just holes and cracks in the walls for ventilation. When the wind would blow in the winter, the room would get very cold. At night, we would need to use eight blankets to keep warm. Like everyone else in this community, we made our living by growing potatoes and raising alpacas. In addition to getting income from our animals, many of the women in our community make products with the wool from the alpacas. We spin the wool by hand, dye the wool with natural dyes that we make from the plants and stones around our community, and then we weave clothes and make handicrafts that we can sell to the tourists. But it takes many days for us to weave even one item to sell. Unfortunately for Angela and others in her community, the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic has prevented tourists from traveling to Peru. All of the extra income the families received from these beautiful handicrafts has suddenly stopped. Today, the demand for raw alpaca wool has dropped so much that it is hardly worth the expense of taking it to market. The income that some of the men were making as tour guides and porters has also ended, and life has become more difficult. And yet, through all of the difficulty, the Quechua people love their highland community. While many youth do leave to try and find work in other parts of Peru, they often return to their homes to once again be with their families and continue the life ways they know and love. One thing that has had a profound difference in recent years is the partnership the community has made with ADRA. Living so high up in the mountains brings many difficulties and challenges. We are always looking for ways that we can improve our lives, but our resources are very limited. We started looking for humanitarian agencies that might help us. Since we are Christian, we prayed that God would send us a Christian organization to help us. Our prayers were answered a couple of years ago when we met people from ADRA. 
We were so delighted when they agreed to come and work with us to improve our community. But where to start? There were so many needs. After discussing our options, it was decided that the best first step would be to build homes for the people that would be warmer and provide a healthier environment for our children. Whenever ADRA does a project like this, we like to involve the people as much as possible so that in the end, they feel a strong sense of ownership. We had the people make all the mud bricks. They gather all the traditional local material for the roof as well. ADRA then works closely with them, providing technical advice and specialized materials to help them build a safe, warm, healthy home. We provide insulation for the ceiling, wood for a floor, the door, and materials for a nice stove that has a chimney to vent the smoke when they cook. We also encouraged the people to take old bottles and put these into the walls as they were building their homes so that they could bring more UV light into their homes to kill bacteria. We do everything that we possibly can to harness the energy of the sun. We have installed a trombe wall in every home. A trombe wall captures the heat from the sun. Rays of the sun are passed through glass or heavy plastic sheets to heat a wall of stone or bricks that has been painted black. This traps the heat in the small space and heats up the wall during the day, which is then slowly dispersed into the home through the night. When we made the new stoves, we also installed a piping system that distributes heat through the wall of the home. We wanted to capture and use every bit of energy and heat that we could. I want to say a big thanks to Adra for coming and helping us build our new beautiful home. In our old house, we suffered a lot. Life was sad and very difficult. Our whole family is now very happy. We don't get sick so much anymore. Now during the winter, we only need three blankets to keep warm at night. The spot I love the most is my beautiful new kitchen. I spend a lot more time there now because it is so nice. I am able to cook our meals easier and there is no more smoke or ash. The wood floor makes it easy to keep my house clean. When the children climb up on the bed, they no longer get the bed dirty from the floor. I really love my new home. I'm so grateful to Adra. In addition to our new warm house, the Adra technician helped us build a bathroom. We have a small spring above our house and we are piping the water from the spring to our bathroom to give us a flush toilet, shower, and sink. The most wonderful thing is that Adra installed a passive solar heating system in the ceiling of our bathroom. This means that for the first time, we have been able to take hot showers. We are so happy that we can enjoy such a luxury. We are so grateful that we can send our boy to school clean. Before Adra came, our life was very sad. We had many difficulties. Our children were always sick. Our house was small, dark, and very cold. But now, everything has changed. Our house is bright, cheerful, and warm. Our children are healthy. When I was painting the outside of our new home, I decided to tell the story of how Adra changed our lives. On one side of the house, I painted a sad face to show how sad and difficult our life used to be. Then, on the other side of the house is a happy face to show everyone how much better our lives are now. Adra not only changed our lives, but showed us a better way to live. It has been a wonderful experience for me to work with the people of the Chilka community. They are so grateful that someone has come to help them. They feel recognized and noticed. They even changed the road sign to include Adra, Peru. They formed Adra on the mountainside above their village, and they want Adra to continue to work with them. They have asked if Adra could build them a church 
and community center and bring a pastor to come and live with them to teach them about the Bible. They want a place where their children can come after school and be tutored on their schoolwork and learn English. They would like us to build a small bakery and show them how to make nutritious bread. They want to rebuild some of their classrooms, build a clinic, so many things they want help with. It is so wonderful to work with a community that is eager to improve their lives and we want to do everything that we can to secure the funding to continue our work here. We are so thankful for the help that we have received from Canada and pray that we will be able to continue that partnership so that we can continue the good work that we have started in Chilka. Well, that gives a, a good overview of the, the trip you on. I just happened to be at the same time on the same trip and, <laughs> yes. and so was able to put that video together. And I think that gives a good overview of the project. But now we'd like to hear your personal experience. Tell, tell us what, uh, from your observations, what you thought of the project there. Yeah, well, first off, I'd like to say that the weather was a lot cooler than I expected. <laughs> You're going to the equator. We're very near the equator and you're freezing, yeah. <laughs> which I found quite quite interesting. But what really struck me was how warm the people were. We were just welcomed with open arms. Mm. You could really see how thankful the the community was for the work that we did, for the the just the differences that we made in the lives of the people. For such actually a very cheap um, project in the end. For an individual home, the, the costs were very reasonable to, to give someone a, a warmer home. For $1,500, we were able to increase the temperature about 10 to 12 degrees in their homes. Mm -hmm. Now, the temperatures in this area go down to, can get down to as low as minus 20 degrees Celsius during the, the cold period of the year. So when you can go from essentially no heat to having, having this, uh, this warmth, what they told me was that they used to sleep with 10 blankets on them and now they only have to sleep with three yeah. to four blankets. So, you know, just that alone is a, is a big difference. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the gentlemen that we met, uh, Nico, uh, was telling us that they, their home is so warm now that they can actually not have, they can start taking off some of their outdoor clothes They now. wouldn't have to wear what you're wearing now, probably. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> their homes got warmer warm enough to be able to do that. The other thing is we provided a solar panel with lights for, for the home so now the kids can study at mm -hmm. night. Um, I think of uh, Santos, the, the mayor that we met there. First I want to mention a little bit about Santos because yes, I found him really, yeah. uh, really interesting guy to, uh, to meet. But what I found so interesting about Santos was we'd be at one village and he'd be there. And we'd leave and Santos was still there. And we'd get to the next village and Santos was already there. <laughs> but he didn't pass us. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember asking him, do you have a twin? Because how are you doing this? And he thought that was just quite funny to, uh, to say. But no, he, he was very committed. So the mayor was a mayor of uh, Chilka, which has a number of smaller communities. He was the mayor of this area. So each small community, he'd show up and, and he'd yeah. be there. But he... He dedicated his week basically to to Adra while yeah. we were there and, and and traveled around with us. He must have known some shortcuts and had a fast horse or something. Exactly. Yeah. He he had a he had his motorbike. Oh, yeah. the motorbike. So he yeah, I'm sure he took some shortcuts that were probably a little rougher than what our vehicle <laughs> yeah. could drive over. Yeah. 
Now, this project has been called the Warm House Project mm -hmm. uh, in Peru. But after having visited there, I've tried to get them to change the name to Warm and Healthy Homes. Mm. You mentioned the dirt floors. In that culture, they like to raise guinea pigs. Yes. <laughs> and the guinea pigs are inside this one-room house because outside, especially in the winter, they would freeze to yeah. death. And so if you can imagine raising guinea pigs inside your dirt floor and having children mm -hmm. at the same time, you can start to understand why they're sick so often. And then when the fuel, you know, cooking and maybe a little bit of heating the home is animal dung and mm -hmm. you're breathing in that, you can understand why they are sick so much. Oh, absolutely. So with this new system, it's warm and healthy homes. Something I, I want to ask you about, when we approached the first main village of Chilka, mm -hmm. they had us get out of the truck and they put you on a horse. Yes. Tell, tell, tell us about that experience. One thing I, I've got to say is whenever I travel, you, you people like to have a few surprises for me. Nobody tells me these things are going to happen until I get there. Um, thankfully, I've, uh, I grew up with horses. Um, my dad owned horses all growing up. So my first, one of my first work experiences was starting my own business called Steve's Horse Rides. Oh, okay. So uh, that was, uh, I did that for three years through high school before going to university. Mm. So showing up there and seeing I had a horse, I said, oh, this is great. Not only do I get to go to Peru, get to go up to about 5,100 meters above sea level at uh, while well, we were there at the highest point. Now I get to go for a horse ride as well with the mayor. Yeah. And we were really treated as these just honored dignitaries as we showed up. I mean, you can, you can see how much they appreciate ADRA and the work that we do in their community. Because they show up and they say, well, you know, whenever an honored dignitary shows up to our community, you have to ride in on a horse. Mm -hmm. You can't just drive into the community. Right. No. Yeah. So the poncho they gave me there was actually a lot more colorful than this right. one. It was a very colorful uh, poncho. And I got to ride with the mayor into, into the community. When we showed up at the first house, um, Marcelano's house, mm -hmm. he, they had a throne built yeah. outside of their <laughs> home for me to sit in. Okay, so these people are descended from the Inca. Mm -hmm. And they explained that when an Inca king would come to the community, they would have a throne for the Inca king. So they had a throne for me to sit on <laughs> as, as a king, <laughs> as we come into their, their community. So, and it was very comfortable. Yeah. But you could actually tell they had just made it because you could look at the concrete and see that it was freshly cured. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you could tell it was, it was a, a throne that they had built specifically for us coming. So how did that make you feel? Was it kind of special? <laughs> you feel special, but very uncomfortable. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> to be there as the kind of that center of attention, right. and they all gathered around, and this was kind of the the initial greeting, but uh, very very nice uh, feeling to be so welcomed and and to be made to feel such a part of of the project and their community right away. Yeah. So yeah, it was. It was great. It was an amazing experience. Another experience uh, I want to ask you about, and that is when the lady uh, said, I want to show you our old house, the house that we used to live in. Mm. And she took us across the, the field a few steps yeah. and uh, had you actually come into the house there. What, what went through your mind and, uh, as you were inside that home? Well, you know, one thing that comes to mind, like our... Uh, our purpose statement at ADRA is so, you know, to serve humanity so all may live as God intended. Mm -hmm. And the first thought that came to my mind is there is no way that God intends anybody to live like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this was, I mean, it, it brought tears to our eyes to, to see this home. First off, I'm, I'm not a very tall person. Now, of course, being in, in this area, I actually was one of the taller people, which was different <laughs> for, for me. I'm usually one of the shortest, but I had to almost crawl into the door to get in. Like you really had to duck down to, to get into the door. Um, the home was about seven feet by 11 feet. Mm -hmm. And they have two kids and they lived in that home until I believe it was about two years ago. Mm -hmm. This is where they lived. It was just a straw thatched roof, um, loosely put together mud bricks and a door that uh, 
the wind would blow, blow through that all day. Oh, yeah. Like there was no insulation to this. And to get inside that room and just dark and it, it was it was actually really, really sad to see that. So the, the, the gentleman's name there was Mario and uh, he was explaining to us about uh, about their, their happy home now. Yeah. And uh, you know, their home was very nice. Um, they had told us how much easier it is to keep their home clean now mm -hmm. as well because of the wood floor. Right. They can sweep the floor. Like it was clean enough you didn't have to wear your shoes in, in mm -hmm. their home. So mm -hmm. it was uh, yeah, very, very nice to see that. I remember also something that was so nice is that it seems like everywhere we went there was a group of people ready to stop us on the road, yeah. <laughs> uh, ready to show us some proposals mm -hmm. of what they would like to do to help develop their community. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I think of one that to, I think like most of the community walked about two hours to deliver this uh, proposal to us. There was another where we were driving through and literally the road was barricaded by kids. We were not going past this location. And they barricaded the road across right in front of their old school. The condition of the school, they had to close it because like, when, when you look at the pictures of them, when we walked in and toured this place, there were cracks all through the walls. Mm -hmm. They told us that the school had been built about 60 years ago. And they, had, they basically had to condemn part of the school. So they're using a smaller portion of the school now for the kids. And because of the limited space and because of COVID, the kids only get to go to school half of what they should be going to school. What the community, they presented me with a full binder mm -hmm. with engineered drawings of, uh, of a new building for, for a school. And they had it fully costed, full cost estimates, mm -hmm. everything was included. So I eat this stuff up because of the engineer in me and my background. I, I, I really enjoyed this. But, um, yeah, they, they had everything laid out. They're ready to go. The only thing is they don't have the money to build it. Right. Uh, but that's one that they've specifically asked us to go back and do. So and we have a, a connections program that we have, which hopefully will get resurrected again shortly as... Uh, as travel restrictions and the world starts to, to open up again. But this is something where I could really see going and having a few groups go over a period of time sure. to build this school for this community. Be a perfect connections oh, yeah. uh, trip for people. The, so ADRA Canada is looking for ways to continue the work there is what I'm hearing you say. Oh, absolutely. This is an area that uh, I fell in love with the area and the needs are great. Yeah. Um, you know, no one should have to live in an uninsulated, unheated uh, home in minus 20 degree weather. And that's unfortunately what's happening there. So one of the things that we're, we're doing is trying to raise funds for a third phase. So we've done two phases of work there. We're looking to raise money for, for a third phase. So there's lots of people that still don't have the nice warm house. We've only met the needs of just under half of what we'd like to be okay, able to do. Yeah. So there, there's still quite a few left. On top of that, um, one of the things we've added in a couple of the homes has been a bathroom. Right. And the bathroom is, is another component. We'd like to go back to some of the homes that we've already um, provided uh, like the, the improvements to and also provide a washroom facility for them as well. One thing is, while, while we were there, you ask, uh, where's the washroom? And they'd, they'd point to the wall. Yeah. It's like, uh, <laughs> not really what I was looking for, but uh, you know, that, that's kind of what, what they have there, or a, a hole, just a pit dug in the ground mm -hmm. with rocks up maybe three feet high. Yeah. So, so what's it gonna take to do phase three? Yeah, right now we're, we're, we're looking to raise about 125,000 for this next phase and um, we do have our Christmas appeal so anybody that uh, you know is on our mailing list they would have received people should be getting that appeal right about the same time that this video airs absolutely right? so yeah it's supposed to be going out the uh, the first week of December so should be hitting the mailboxes during during that time great so 
going in and donating to that will help us to achieve this goal. And you say uh, $1,500 gets a family a nice, new, warm, healthy home. Absolutely. And then uh, it's about $750 to $1,000 for the bathroom as well. Okay. So for about $2,500, we can really transform a family's life by giving them you know, a healthy place to live, which is warm, that is lit, and has running water and a hot shower for $2,500. Yeah. So this is the, uh, the type of difference we can make just with you know, not really a lot, of, a lot of funds when you think about it. I think individuals who may be watching this video could say, I can do that, I can sponsor yeah. one. Or maybe a church group or a school say, I could, we yeah. could put together a little fundraising program and, and get a family a nice home. I think that would be a good project. Absolutely. For a group or, or even an individual. Yeah, yeah. And if anybody's looking for ways to connect or any ideas around that as well, I mean, they can certainly call the office and um, get, uh, get the information or, or go to our website and learn more about the project because there will be lots of information on our website and then also through our shelter fund that we have. Uh, the funds that go into the shelter fund can be used for, for a project like this as well. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for being our guest today and telling us about your trip to Peru. For our viewers, if uh, you enjoyed this podcast, we have many others like this. Uh, we have actually a group of seven podcasts for this week of ADRA emphasis. So it'd be wonderful if you could take a look at all of them. But for now, we'll say farewell and uh, see you next time. Thank you, Steve.